human beings are storytellers. We've always been storytellers. Before we wrote stuff down, people would sit around in the dark, around a campfire, and tell stories. Some of the stories were about the hunt. Some of the stories were about being, that time that, that, that something happened when we were out trying to gather food. The time that the, the, that, that, that critter chased you, the, 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 the time, we're storytellers. And then we make up fiction as well. And dear, I, it, it's a funny thing. I honestly wasn't explicitly conscious about, like, I gotta like open this thing up to the whole world kind of thing. It just like, the, the universe was just pushing me this way. And I knew that the next step in my journey was to now take this to other people, to gather like-minded folks, yes. to help them experience the healing that I experienced. Yeah. It's a, like it's a standard shaman's journey. Yeah. The, you know, the, the wounded, you know, the, 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 the wounded healer. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are still in Cambridge in Massachusetts. We are now gonna be talking about how we are the stories we tell. We have Bob Cohen joining us on the show, hello. Hey, how are you? Thank you so much for coming on, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, it's been a great pleasure. Yes, it's been such a pleasure meeting you and learning about your journey and what you're building. Bob Cohen is the founder of Ouroboro Story Hour, the True Tales of Healing and Altered States, which is an unscripted storytelling project that focuses on consciousness hacking practices, plant medicines, traditional psychedelics, healing, and maximizing our potential as human beings. And you can check out the links in the bio below to their Facebook page, Ouroboros Story Hour, as well as you can get in touch with their Gmail, Hour at gmail.com. And we wanna give a shout out to the Whole Living Center, which is where we're shooting this interview at. This is Emilia Sabatowska's space. She's the founder. It's a psychotherapy, health coaching, and online workshop space right here in Mass Ave in Cambridge. So huge shout out to her. And let's jump right into it, Bob. So we love asking our guests, we find ourselves as stewards of Earth. What is your current take on the state of humanity? The current take on the state of humanity? I think we are in a crisis of um, compassion. People are, people are so focused on taking care of themselves and their families and their tribe that they've lost this idea of we being in this whole thing all together. And it's, it, it informs people's opinions. And it's, it's as simple as things like, I, I'm, so I'm not young, so I, I, I argue politics on Facebook with my, uh, my, 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 middle-aged, my middle-aged friends. And my conservative, and I'm, I, I don't live in an echo chamber, so I make sure to cultivate friends across political spectra. When we have conversations, they're, they're, we miss each other because they're thinking utilitarian, they're thinking theoretical, and I'm thinking, how can we take care of people that need to be taken care of? And we just, we, we just miss each other. And I feel like if they could remember that there's more to life than that, you know, that, that $150 bottle of uh, fancy wine that they wanna buy and that the person that we put across on the street um, may not have a place to live, may not have food, that maybe we can buy a $50 bottle of wine and do something better with that other hundred. A crisis of compassion. Yeah. Yeah, a, such a deep focus on our own sustenance and also the sustenance of our families uh, in our nuclear families that we uh, have forgotten about the interdependent uh, global village. But even global, yes. But even just even in your town, even your town, even yeah. in, in, on, on your street, you know that neighbor that you know, that you don't get along with. Like, well, what's going on with that? It, it's and and it's, it's it's the kind of thing where I don't know how you teach that. I mean, I, I, and and I don't know how I don't know how to engage that in a conversation where people who are more utilitarian don't feel judged because I'm saying, well, I'm better than you because you know I actually give a shit about. People and you, all you care about is you know your BMW 5 Series and, and that you know that that uh, that vacation you want to go on at, uh, you know in, in Italy. The the message that you uh, that you're broadcasting right now, I think, is 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 critical for us to reflect on how we actually 
uh, have more meaning and fulfillment in our lives when we do uh, compassionate things with the extra that we have. Yeah. With all that we have, not just the extra. Yeah. Yeah. With all that I we mean, have. Be show up and be with yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is, now you're getting a really good taste of Bob. I, I, I love this. I love this so much. All right, Bob was actually born in New York City, and then he moved to Boston around the age of 28. And I want you to teach people about this journey that you've been on and coming out of the psychedelic closet. Well, well, unlike maybe some of your guests, I have a way longer journey, so I'll, try, I'll do what I can to keep this brief. So in the mid-80s, I was in a PhD program at Stony Brook University for English Literature. And we had some family issues, and we, my wife, I had just gotten married, and my wife and I decided that it was in our best interest as our own nuclear family to be someplace else than where we were. So we moved from Stony Brook to Boston, and the original intention was to stay there for a year. So I was in the third, I was in third year of the program, had finished up my my coursework, and was getting ready to do orals and, and write a dissertation, and a year turned into thirty years. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how the it's funny how these things happen. You know, you put down roots, even if you don't intend. Even I didn't intend to put down roots here. Um, I still feel like I'm. I still feel like a, 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 I'm still suffering from from what, what do we call that? Uh, uh, well, we'll move on. So, you know, we get here. We 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 we, we get. We I want to open space for that last thought that you were having. Just a minute, minute ago. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I was struggling over words. We'll, we'll talk about words later on. So oh, I, I, okay. I, I lost okay. the word that, you know, that... that, that oh, okay. That, that, okay. Uh, uh, cult, cultural dissonance. Like, I feel, oh. I feel like you know, the culture in New England is very different from culture in New York. And so I have never felt like I fit in here. Uh, you think about that, that old Frost poem, you know, The Mending Wall. The, the payoff line, the last line of the poem is, Good fences make good neighbors. And that very much informs the different psyches between New York and New England. Um, the, my standard joke is that if you're online in New York and you're there for any length of time, you can start a conversation with the person next to you and it could be some, you know, something as stupid as, you know, having to, back in the day, like how, how about George Steinbrenner, isn't he a nut, right? Here, when you talk to someone online anywhere, to a, an actual New Englander, I always feel like they're looking for the wet spot in my pants. You know, like they're, they're sure I'm crazy because like, why are you talking to me? I don't know you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, you know, you, you can like, you know, there, there's this like this cultural dissonance. And the funny thing is that in my family, I'm the least New Yorker of all of my family. I mean, I, I like, like I've lost my accent and I'm not as, I'm not as out there. I'm a, I, I was actually the demure one in my family, but here, I've always been viewed as the person who's way out there. And that had, I, I used to be a selectman in my town, and that, like, that was my reputation because I said, I said what was on my mind. Mm -hmm. And I didn't pull punches. I was never unkind. Well, maybe sometimes, but I try not to be. <laughs> uh, I, it, but it was this idea of, well, keep your thoughts to yourself. You know, just put a smile on your face and, and remember, good fences make good neighbors. And then take us all the way up until yeah, sure. the story you told in two years ago when you were starting up yeah. Ouroboros. I said, you want me to jump? Because like, you know, from, from there, you know, I, I did a number of things. I was a full-time freelance writer for, 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 for about 10 years. Um, I had a, had a small web design practice that I kind of did in between. And then my wife was the CEO of a, a, um, a national nonprofit organization. So by the time we hit my late 30s or mid 30s, we, you know, the, the, the subject of family came up and we wanted to, we wanted to have a family and she had a six figure salary and, and, um, and, and, and benefits. And I had a really cool job. I, I wrote about, I did adventure journalism. So I'd go on like rock climbing trips, ice, ice climbing trips, scuba diving, like I've cut holes in lakes and gone, gone scuba diving under, 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 the, under the, the ice. But of course that doesn't pay real well. So we agreed that I would stay home and, and raise the kids. And that went all the way to about 2008. Wow. When, uh, and my wife, so my wife had been in her job uh, when she was, you know, uh, well, from when she was like 29 or so until, I, I won't say how old she is anymore. I won't say how old she is now, I'll get in trouble. Um, and there was a, she had a crisis at work. 
she, uh, the, 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 the president of the, uh, the board of directors decided he wanted to spend money to enrich his friends. Mm. And she drew a line. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't having it. So he actually assaulted her in, after a board meeting. She brought up the issue about the assault. The board circled the wagons around the president, the man. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, she ended up losing her job. And so we went from six-figure six figure salary to, holy fuck, what are we going to do now? Mm -hmm. So that was, around two, that was around 2008. Mm -hmm. And over the last, well, it's, I guess, 11, getting on 11 years mm -hmm. now, we've been sort of like working to deal with that trauma and the effects on, um, on, on, on our, our family life, our home life, our, our finances. I mean, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, in, 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 story, in story hour, like I'm pretty open about it. I mean, almost lost my house a few times. Um, we really had to scramble and struggle to keep our home and to keep our family together and to make sure that our children didn't, understood what was going on, but didn't feel the deep effects of the trauma from what was going on for both of us. And so uh, my wife's story is really not mine to tell, so I'll tell my story in this. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was hard. And almost losing your house multiple times, yeah, yeah. trying to recalibrate with children, how to deal with finances. Yeah, how to, yeah. how to deal with finances. And don't forget, now I'd been out of the job market for a bunch of years, so yes. even, even, though, you know, even though I've got a master's degree with 30, you know, 30 credits toward, toward a PhD, um, it's like, what have you done for me lately is really how, you know, really what it was. So it w was not easy for me to kind of plug in and find, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and find something that worked. So we, we worked hard at that. And around 2013, um, we found ourselves in a situation where we didn't have health insurance. And the, my family, every, every family has a curse. So my family's curse is uh, bad arteries. So my dad, his brother, their father and whoever else from back in the old country, they all died in their 50s from, from, from heart attacks. And we had, the, the, the money that we had within the assets like kind of pushed us outside the bounds of qualifying for mass health. It's, but we would periodically try. So by the, time, by the summer of 2013, I was very sick. Like just walking down, I would break out into a sweat walking down to the, the, to the mailbox. And so wow. I, I kind of resolved myself to, well, I have, a, I have a good life insurance policy. I don't want to leave my family. I, I don't want to burden my family with medical debt. Oh, well, I guess I'm going to die. And I just, I let go of my life. And somehow or another, it's, this, is like, this is really like where the journey begins in, 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 in earnest. We, you know, we periodically make these calls to Mass Health. So my wife called and she got a woman on the phone whose name was Luce, L-U-C-E, which is light. Mm -hmm. Somehow or another, I, don't, I will never know how this worked, somehow or another, we found ourselves with you know, being covered by Mass Health. Wow. Within a week, I was at a Brigham and Women's Hospital having a heart surgery. When they looked at um, the data, uh, three of my arteries, arteries were 99% blocked. No. My fourth one was 85% um, blocked. And my doctors looked at me and said, how are you not dead? So here's a really, it's a really cool thing. Um, your heart actually creates uh, peripheral blood vessels when the big ones get, when, when the big ones get oh blocked up. Gosh. So it was like keeping me going. Wow, now, 99% 99 blocked, blocked three, three, of three, three of them, yeah. And then here's this like, really crazy thing that happened. So as I'm, you know, and as we're kind of like moving into this like late summer, this late, late into the late summer, um, I fall asleep and I have a dream. So I'm a, among the things I do is I'm a writer. So I, I wrote a novel a bunch of years ago that I've been, I, that I just keep on rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. So I had, I fall asleep, I have this dream. I'm in a room with who, this person who's like my, my literary mentor. And we're talking about the story. And he says to me, that's a good story, but I got another one for the, that you have to work on. And I said, and the name of the main character is going to be Tola, T-O-L-A-H. So, okay, well, what the hell's Tola, right? Okay, so he says to me over and over again, T-O-L-A-H, T-O-L-A-H, T-O-L-A-H. I wake up, 
Tola is on the tip of my tongue. Mm -hmm. I go to my handy dandy uh, phone, hit the, you know, Google Tola. It's a word that appears in the Bible two times. Mm. And one of the places that it, uh, one of the places it appears is, I think it's Psalm 24. It's my God, my God, why have you, why have you forsaken me? Mm. And so I read through the, I, I, you know, I read through the, you know, pull, I pulled up my Bible app, um, read, you know, read, read, the, um, read, read the poem, and I am, I'm, I'm a card-carrying atheist. I experience grace. My body, like, I, like something happened to my body in that moment. And it was like, wow. Wow. And then, and then I, mean, so I told the story a little out of sequence. That happens. Then Luce comes along. Then I'm in, uh -huh. th th then I'm in the, in the hospital. So I have three big ass stents. They're like yeah. this long. They, and they were they were so blocked and, so, and they were so brittle that the doctor said that if I were say five or six years older, they would have cracked my chest and done a bypass. Instead, they put they, they put in stents. And really cool, they went through an artery. In yeah. my wrist, yeah. like these do them through the groin, yeah, which, yeah, which yeah. Where, where it's like a big pain in the ass. Yeah. Within two days, I went from profoundly sick to like I could run. I, I, if they would have let me, I could have gone out running. Like, two days later, wow, what a crazy change in state. Of yeah, and it was like body, it yeah. was like this big shift. And so, you know, we're, later on we're going to talk about um, about how psychedelics interact with our, 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 our consciousness, but. There are a lot of ways that you know that you can have these consciousness-altering events that kind of lead me to the idea that really what psychedelics do and what any of these practices do is they open up doors for us and that they lead us to a so to the source to the source yes which is us yes, yes. right it's 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 this re reframing thing so here I am now I'm not dead because I, I fully expected to be dead by September or October of 2013, yeah. like fully, completely. And then it was like, holy fuck, I'm not going to die now. What? Because <laughs> I, you know, in in a, in a funny sort of way, you know, the the idea of like dying from a heart attack, like that gets me off the suicide hook, right? My suffering's over. My family gets some money, and I get pay, I get relief from my pain. Because at that you know at, at that time we still hadn't sorted our we still really hadn't sort, sorted our situation. Only now I'm not dead. Mm -hmm. So we, there's this initial state of euphoria where like wow you know I feel great you know, and then there's like well now what meaning yeah meaning. You're like now now what and that actually made me more depressed than I was before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we hit the summer of 2014 and I'm I'm out of my mind like. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to check out again. Um, and I came across an article. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty, I, I'm not, I, there, there were three articles that I'd read that summer. Uh, one was in the Washington Post, one was in uh, the New Yorker, and one was, uh, I forget where the other one was. One of them was a Michael Pollan article. So, I, you know, we could, it would be like a nice tidy story to say Michael Pollan got me here. So they were talking about the, the research at Johns Hopkins and, and NYU, yeah. the psilocybin research. So I thought to myself, well, yeah, you know, I tried mushrooms a couple times in 1980 when I hitchhiked around the country. That sounds like that could work. It was, it was a very pleasant experience. I just did it to, you know, you know, just to get messed up. And this idea was born that, that psychedelics were going to sort of like help me reconfigure my, my, my being. Only I was in my mid fifties, and so the joke I like to tell about it is, when you're, say like sixteen to twenty four, twenty five to twenty six, if you're still in school, you know who, you know the drug dealers, you know where to go to score your acid, to score your mushrooms, to score whatever it is you want. So you get into the, your late twenties, early thirties, you still have friends that are in school, so you know people who know people, and then eventually you don't know anybody. So I'm like, all right, so what am I going to do? So I do two things. I start educating myself about psychedelics. So I'm, I'm hitting, you know, going, hitting Jay's store and you know, doing, reading, reading the journal stuff, you know, reading the, the, you know, the neuroscience, reading the, reading, reading, reading the research, trying to like educate myself on the language and like understanding what's going on. And it's just, just push, 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 push. And eventually the understanding comes. And 
in the process of doing that self-education, I discovered the Horizons New Perspectives and Psychedelics Conference. Mm -hmm. So it was in New York. Now, at that time, we really didn't have any money. And I'm like, I got to go there. I have to go to, mm -hmm. uh, I have to go to Horizons. So fortunately, it's, it's in New York City, it's in the village. And for, I'm from New York, so I was able to get to New York, stay at my mom's house out on Long Island, mm -hmm. and take the, take the train in. Yeah for both days of the conference. So we're midway through the conference, and the, I think it was the NYU team that was up, but I forget what the hell they were talking about, but it was like some, some research, and so they were doing work on uh, near, end, of life, yeah. end of life trauma and um, something else. So they're, you know, they're like, we, we get to the Q&A portion of the, uh, of, 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 of the presentation, and I stand up and I go, this is really great. I'm so, you know, really encouraged about this. You know, you're taking care of all, the, all these people that are fundamentally safe. Like if you're, work, you're working with people who are gonna be dead in six months, like you can experiment with them with these things. And so I go, well, what I said was, I said, I'm not asking you where, where I can score drugs, but you know, can you help a brother out? So it's like, I got the laugh in the room that I wanted. Can you help a brother out? Yeah, yeah, can, yeah. can you help a brother out? Yeah. You know, and you know, when are you going, but that yeah. then went to like, so you know, when, when is it gonna be for you know, your garden variety, depressives and anxious people who just wanna blow their brains out because life is so painful that they suck. <sighs> so harumph, 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 you know, we get the, we know we'll get there eventually, you know, have, have patience. So like, meanwhile, like, so that's that's that, that's that's September. That's early October of, uh, of of 2014. I'm losing my fucking mind, and I, I literally put a rope around my neck. They went into my garage, got up on the got up on the ladder, I, 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 and I, I used to rock climb, so I had to tie knots. Yeah. And I designed it so that the you know, so that the force would so that the force of me putting the weight on it would drop down. It wouldn't swing. Like yeah. I, I had this like all, all planned out. And then I thought to myself, my kids are gonna come home and find me this way. Yeah. And so I got down. Wow. And so at the, um, you know, at, 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 the, at, at the conference, at the, like, after I had-, after I had um, that's, that, that's a profound shift when you think about the people that are gonna be affected by the decision. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, it's because yeah. it's not about you at that point. You know, it, it really isn't. It's like it's your relate. It's that compassion thing, right? Yeah. It's that. It's what's your relationship to the people yes. in your life, and what you know. What do you you know? What how, how much can you take so that because me being miserable is way better than me killing myself. And there is also a way to not be miserable, and that right. is what the discovery. Right, the, right. This is the, this is the discovery. So at the at the at the Horizons conference, uh, this woman came up to me at the very end of the day, and she's the first. She's she's the second angel. Like the, the, I actually have had like in, in my journey, like there are a number of like really concrete angels who came into my life. So there's the angel for my dream. There's Luce, and then there's a, a woman named uh, Mary Kay from New York City. And she saw me like through the cheekiness, through through the you know, through through this you know the snarky thing, and she said, "I heard you. I know how you feel. I know somebody, but I wanted to meet you first to make sure to, to have a conversation with you. I'm gonna go talk to this guy, and I'll t I'll, I'll you know I'll, I'll find you tomorrow and I'll let you know what's what." So the, on the Sunday of the conference, she comes up to me. She gives me a name. She says, There's this guy in the Upper West Side um, who trips it, and he he worked he worked with MDMA and with mushrooms. So my interest at that at that time was mushrooms, in part because I was afraid MDMA is a, a vasoconstrictor, and so with you know with, with having the stents, I was had some concerns because it's 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 a methamphetamine based drug. So I had some concerns about how that might affect my yeah. my new apparat my new apparati. Yeah. So we go. So I call him up, and he says, "Okay, you can come, but I have we we have a network of people. There's somebody in Providence. Once you, I'll I'll get you in touch with that person." So I'm like really desperate at this point. Yeah. So he connects me with this this person in Providence. We talk, and I think at the end of the day, I'm I'm going to use uh, I'm, I'm going to use the the, the pronouns that. Uh, disguise uh, gender, uh, they, so I think they uh, were concerned that they wouldn't be able to handle my situation while I was tripping. Wow. 
they like to use a very high dose of mushrooms, seven grams, which, wow. is, which is a <laughs> which is a lot. Wow. And so they said, I really can't. We we couldn't like we couldn't meet each other, and they said, Well, I'm going to connect you with a psychotherapist the, 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 that would start you at a lower. Well, the, with this person, the, with this person who actually was not a psychotherapist, interestingly enough, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to connect. You, I'm going to bounce you back to our friend in New York. Okay. I call up our friend in New York. Arrangements are made. January of 2015. Mm -hmm. I'm in New York City, uh, which is right down the street from where I was born. It was Upper wow. West Side, so I was born at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, yeah. which is uh, like 110th Street. It's, yeah. it's up in Morningside Heights, so I'm you know maybe like 15 blocks from there, lying on Riverside, uh, in, in like in a couch on Riverside Drive. So we started out with two and a half grams of mushrooms, and I got stuck in a loop. So, but my, my, my New York friend says, "Well, you seem to be stuck in a loop. Do you want more?" Okay, <laughs> sure. So I ended up taking five grams on my first trip. Whoa. What loop were you stuck in? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm also a practicing Zen Buddhist. So yeah. I got stuck in this loop where I realized the absurdity of the Zen practice and the, and the, <laughs> the koan practice. That you're, or, I, I, I practice a form of uh, Korean Zen, so they call them koans, but it's K-O-A-N, people know, know it as. And I was, kind of, I was stuck on one, and I'd been stuck on one for a really long time. So then I started having this conversation with the dead founder of this, dead, dead Korean monk founder of, <laughs> of, the, of, 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 the, um, of the quantum school of Zen. Yeah. And we're like, and I'm just, and I'm just doing like I'm doing now, like gesticulating and, and you know, like, and I'm like, but this is, you know, this is fucking ridiculous. Like, why do I have to know, you know, if, you know, if Bodhi, you know, Bodhidharma came to China, you know, to China and what, what, who gives a fuck if he's got a beard or not, right? <laughs> so. They upped the dose to get past. Yeah, so, so, so I'm like looping, 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 looping. So, the, so, so, so my, my friend from New York, you know, ups the dose to, and he did, he did some funky stuff with sound. So once I got past that, it was the most extraordinary thing. I, I. I say, I, I ended up like revisiting my infancy. Like I regressed back to, Whoa. I regressed back to, to like, yes. to, to baby state. And I, 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 I want to be careful about how I always say this because some things are not my stories to tell. Mm -hmm. But I needed to be loved in a way that I wasn't. Yes. And we all do. Yeah. 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 And, and so I actually went back and gave myself. Yes that stuff that was missing from me. Yes. And it was this profoundly healing thing. Yes. yes. And then like so three so three 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 big three big things happened in the, in, in in that in that experience. So there's this piece. Then the other piece is that my dad, who was a lieutenant in the New York City Police Department, he retired on the captain's on the captain's list. Um he's a really brilliant guy, but he also didn't know how to play with it. Didn't know how to he was like all about power and, and you know he just like didn't know how to Play the politics end of things. So he never like like he could have been. He was smart enough to be police commissioner. He got stuck in like the civil service thing, and then he ended up like ending his life in a way that was not satisfactory for him because he died a year after he retired from the police department. And then my great uncle Henry Mady was a painter and sculptor in New York City. So he, his parents were uh, Polish immigrants, and he's completely self-taught. His work is extraordinary. It's exquisite. Same thing though. Like he couldn't. Like he couldn't, they couldn't figure out how to like get out of their own way to, to open up themselves to the world so that they could, the world could embrace them and their and their their brilliance. Like these were really smart guys. And, and so, I went back to them. So I went back like, and and I had a conversation with them. I said, "Look, you guys are all done." I said, "I got this now. I will carry this forward for us." So you don't have to worry anymore. You you got you guys can rest. That's great. And then the other the other kind of crazy thing was like I was like doing all these crazy rituals and whatever. Like I, I'm I'm out. <laughs> I'm saying like it was I was a bedwetter and I didn't realize how traumatic it was. Mm. And so I went through this whole thing with rituals and I pour, I ended up like pouring water all over my all down my shirt mm -hmm. like down in my pants mm -hmm. and then changing. Yeah. So I come up out of this. You know, I I come up out of this this experience. Having healed, like, like done, like done, you know, done ancestor work, done you know, like done, done fundamental trauma work, yeah. and I'm like, wow, 
this is you know this, you know, this is like this is the deal. Yes. So, but I'm still back with this problem of where do I score drugs? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finding meaning, further meaning yeah. in life. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. What a what an insane series of life experiences from the clogged arteries near the heart, 99% clogged, to then needing to find meaning when you regain that state change, and then all the way to uh, all the trauma that was healed and, the, and, and what you experienced with your first psilocybin experience, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, and all the way up to, you know, to where you're at now. And, and it, I'm really excited to be able to talk about that because I think it's so fascinating that you've taken what was the, some of the most profound experiences of your life and you've really built on top of them and shown it, made spaces for other people to be able to express themselves um, at their fullest as well. Yeah. 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 So can't score drugs, more research, I grow my own mushrooms. Wow. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I kind of like, I worked that out. So I 2016? Have, well, through 2015 and 15 15 16. 16. And I don't have anybody to trip sit for me, so I'm, now I'm fooling around, I'm experimenting with microdosing. Microdosing. And you know, I set up, you know, I, I followed, you know, followed the Fodderman protocol meticulously, yeah, you know, took yeah, my notes, correct, yes. got it, you know, had a digital scale, you know, weighed out, all, you know, weighed out my Excellent, dosages, yeah. all, that, all that fun stuff. And how often were you dosing? And uh, I did a total of, from 2015 till last, till last year, to the beginning of 2018, I did a total of six rounds of, um, Six, six rounds of microdosing. So it's for, it's forty days, and then I would not dose. You know, I wouldn't take any for a while because I wanted to. Because the idea was like I didn't want to be dependent on on drugs. Totally. So you would do like uh, maybe a gram or something. No, no, point one gram. Oh, point. Wow, that's so little. That's yeah. microdosing. That's really low. So point one um, every day for forty days. No, no. Every no, other day. No, every no, third no, day. Every, every fifth fourth day. day. So Every the the, the Fodderman protocol is yes. a, a tenth of a, a tenth of an active dose, okay, and you take and you redose every fourth day. Every fourth day, so that right. so you have your time of sobriety and then another dose. Right. So then you did it ten times over forty days. Well, you, you right ten times. So that it was yeah. a, you, you do that and then and then you take a couple and then you rest break. right and then yeah. and then do it. And what were you experiencing on the days that you would take the point one grams? Heart opening. More so than on the control days. Well, the, 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 idea with, the idea with microdosing is it's sub-perceptual. So it's not unlike taking Prozac. So it's where only with that, without all the, the, the shitty side effects, like not being able to get hard on. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you don't feel anything explicit, but it's this kind of gradual thing that you, you like, it, it, think of it like when when we um, when someone has, has has been in extreme exposure, we don't throw we don't, we don't throw them in hot water. We gradually raise up their temperature. So it's that same. It was that same thing. Like just gradually, yeah. Over the course of a couple of years, opened my heart. Yeah, yeah. Little bit by little, by bit, little by, bit. By, by little bit. Interesting. And then, um, as you're experiencing that, where are you finding? Uh, differences in you know and your heart opening up is this amongst finding meaning in life is this with finding meaning in family and your children and your community where was it most with purpose etc it starts with for me it started with my relationship with myself mm -hmm. right you know they people say all the time that you can't love other people until you love yourself yeah and so it, it was that because it's, it's, we have this conversation when people talk about forgiving. Like forgiving is not about letting the guy off the hook that did you dirty. It's about letting yourself off the hook for having been done dirty. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, there's a, there's always that thought. Well, if I'd have done this, that person wouldn't hurt me. If I'd have done that, you know, it's the victim blaming thing. Yeah. And so it was like it, it it kind of like established that part of my journey forward. In in what I call I call these my bonus years. Yeah, my bonus years. <laughs> I'm yeah. supposed to be dead, so so I, I got to you know I got to reinvent you know I got to reinvent myself. Yes, yes, and then be able to inspire other people. Yeah, to do the yeah, same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we kind of go along with this, and then 
every year after, I kept on going back to, um, to, 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 to Horizons. So after my third year, I got uh, connected up with a, a guy named Lex Pelger, who used to be part of Symposium. Mm -hmm. And we just like, you know, we, we hit it off, we had fun chatting with each other. And in my, thir in my third horizon, so it's 2014, 15, so 2016, um, he invited me back to the, af to the after party at his place in Bed-Stuy. That's Bedford-Stuyvesant for you folks who aren't from New York, <laughs> which used to be one of the worst neighborhoods in Brooklyn. I mean, like, scare my dad worked in Bed-Stuy in the 70s, you know, back when there were 2,500 murders a year in New York. So it, was, it, was, it used to be a dangerous ass place. So I find myself at this, at, at the, at, at this party and I'm the oldest person there by, by a lot, but whatever, like I'm, I'm tickled that you know, someone would think to invite me to something like that. And it's like part of this like whole rebirth thing. So I'm there, so I'm talking with one of uh, Lex's roommates, um, actually Mary Kay's daughter, Catherine. Mm. Now this is now another angel in the, in, in the, uh, in, in the story. So I tell her the story about, the, um, uh, about standing up and you know, saying, can you help a brother out? And she goes, that was you? That was you, that's funny. <laughs> they go, yeah. yeah, we all thought you were a narc. <laughs> uh -huh. So we, you know, we, we, we got a good chuckle, that, you know, we got a good chuckle out of it. You know, there's, like a, there's a funny, uh, I don't, we don't have time to do this, so there's, there's actually a funny drug story that, at that party. But anyway, you know, we, we talk, so Lex floats back into the conversation and he says, you know, we, we, we kind of like relate this thing. He goes, oh, that was you? Like, yeah. He goes, you got to come. So Lex, one of the things Lex did was he actually did story, he did, he organized storytelling things. He goes, awesome. you got to come to my thing in Brooklyn. And I go, oh, okay. So he invited me, it was at a place called Hell Kitchen, which I think is in, um, it, it's either in Bed-Stuy or, or, or Bushwick, I forget which. But he goes, you got to come. I said, okay, well, as long as I can crash on your couch, no problem. So, a month later, I'm now at a you know a hip, in you know the in the hip capital of the universe, <laughs> in the hip, the hipster capital of the universe, telling a story about my 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 my, my, my journey to you know the, my, my my journey to psychedelics. Excellent. And it was like bam. So this I'm a is writer. 2016. Yeah, 2016. So I'm a yeah. writer, and I tell stories, and this kind of like falls right in. And what's really cool is that it got me out of the, the preparation for telling unscripted storytelling for me is very different from when I'm writing a story yeah, because totally. there were no notes. Yes. And I composed the entire story without ever writing it down on paper and I would drive around in my car and practice. And so you know, I had you know, I, you know, had my you know, I hit all you know, hit all three marks in the you know the the Aristotelian exactly. story yeah, arc, yeah, right? Yeah. I got I got this down, we, and, and it came off really well. So I'm out, fooling with my microdosing. We had I had a really great time. I, now I really dig telling stories. So Lex comes back to Lex come, comes up to Boston. That so now we're getting to the I guess the uh, spring of 2017. The Northeastern's SSDP, so that Students for Sensible Drug Policy yes. group, was doing sort of like a shout out to them, yeah, and also shout out to Ismail Ali, yeah, to Ismail, and, yeah, and shout out to Rick Doblin and Liana Sananda and Maps. Yep, we love Maps. Maps.org. Please go check them out. Yeah, you know, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. They're so far along with helping make the movement happen. Yeah, Students for Sensible Drug Policy is a very important organization, yep. and they're really getting into the minds of young people. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so so real cool. So Lex is Lex is doing this is you know, hosting the storytelling thing. So he you know he asked me to come and share my story again. So that was a, actually a funny night because I started out my story with, "Does anybody know where I can score LSD, ayahuasca, mushrooms?" And the, 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 you know I'm pretty good at this. Like the whole like the whole room was like. Did he just ask to buy drugs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you know, I go into you know this, this spiel that I you know the, the, the story that I that, that I, that to, I, that yeah, I just yeah. told. And then at the at, at the end of the night, um, a very a person I've become friends with, a very a very dear young man came up to me later on. and He says, "Come here, I got to." He invited me into the bathroom. He he tore out a sheet. He tore off like a, he tore off like three or four hits of acid, wrapped it up in a piece of paper, and said, "Here." Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So it's like so. So we do this now. Now, I, but also at that, also at that event were um, some people from what is called the uh, Boston Theogenic Network. 
So it's really, it's a Facebook group. And what we say, um, what's the term of art everyone seems to use? It was a group of like-minded people. I think that's what people say now. You know, like, like the mafia says, you know, he's a friend of us. He's a good fella, mm -hmm. right? You know, in the psychedelic community, we're like-minded people yeah. or like-hearted people, if you like yeah. that better. Yeah. And they invited me to come to their meetings. So I'm like, okay, cool. Now I have a place, I, I have an audience where I can develop this storytelling project because I'm really big into telling stories. So I go there, I meet with um, uh, a woman named Leah Friedman. She's one of the founders of Ben and uh, Nathaniel Putnam is another one of the founders of Ben and a few other people. And we were meeting in this uh, Booz Allen space like on the 24th floor in Milk, on, on Milk Street, like this like ultra, you know, 21st century corporate space, you know, wide open, pool tables, foosball, all this shit. And this is where we're having meetings about psychedelics. Yeah. So I get this idea, like I want to tap this audience and make, and, and make the storytelling thing yes, happen. Yes. So this pushes us into the summer of, of 2017. Yeah. Awesome. We, I started out the, just up the road here is the, 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 the Cambridge Democracy Center. So they're like, very, they're a direct action, their, their mission is direct action. So I call them up to, about space. My project wasn't quite right for them. They directed me to uh, an, or, uh, uh, an organization called Makeshift Boston, mm -hmm. which is a cooperative working space. So freelancers get together. They, um, you know, they, they work during the day. They rent the space out at night. Mm -hmm. So I make the arrangements to get the space, and they really dig this project. Good. So they give me a good deal. Mm -hmm. And that was August of 2017. And that's when you went up and gave your first talk at your yeah, first at, 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 right yeah. at my first story hour. Yeah, and and you were refined at that point because you had given the talk several a couple times. times. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you know, I, I just you know, I had I had like you know, the, the I, I could do this, and I, I, I was also a public official, so uh, you know, I'm pretty I'm pretty comfortable talking in front of crowds anyway. Like I'm, and you had your first. Uh, your first stint in uh, curation too, yep. which is great. So you had to actually identify several others to follow up. Right. Uh, I, I, you after you introed it, and then they also told about their experiences. Yeah, with hacking consciousness. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay, so then the okay, so now the formation of this happens. We have your big. Uh, we have your big story about coming out and about, you know, well, we didn't even really get to like how you ended up talking to your family and your community and how hard that is to to do that in the process. Yeah. yeah. Tell us a bit about it. Yeah, sure. That. So again, it all starts with your relationship with yourself. Yes. Or it's, I, 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 like, I don't like to put it the way, it started with my relationship with myself. Yes, yes. Am I okay with this? Because, I mean, this is a fact of life until things change illegal drugs and now I'm a policeman's son and here I am taking illegal drugs because I'd never really you know I'm not a lawbreaker and I have to you know I had to get okay with that but things were so like you know there, there was there was a movement going on there was there, there was this the universe was pushing me in it it was gently not so gently guiding me in a direction I guess I almost died I said, Correct. course correction here, you know, this is, this is where we have to go. So I, this is like part of how I have been able to come out of the closet was to learn to accept the guidance from the universe and to get in touch with my intuition. Interesting. Yes. Yes. And then that assisted with getting in yeah. touch with your family, right. your community. Right, because if you do, if, and when we do things where we're a little, where, 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 where there's shame involved, it's hard to engage other people. So you're confident in yourself and the way that you are engaging with these, with your own consciousness hacking experiences. Yep. And then you engage with your family, your community based on your own confidence with those experiences. Ex exactly. So with family, because I couldn't buy drugs, I had to grow mushrooms. Everybody had to know. I mean, I, I'm not going to hide things from my from my family. So everybody knew Dad was growing drugs, you know, growing growing mushrooms. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I, I was always very cautious to, you know, to to uh, frame it. And it's actually how I frame it in my mind anyway. But it's it's medicine. You know, I'm growing medicine, medicine because yeah. the medicine the doctors give me don't yeah, work. The, yes, correct, correct. They, they 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 make the medicines the doctors give me make me sicker. Yes, correct, correct. So this is so this is what I'm doing to help myself. Yeah, for. Thousands of years is what we've been 
yeah. helping ourselves with yeah. and yeah the natural secretions of planet earth of gaia and yeah, yeah and here we are <laughs> millennia later putting it as a ban uh, a yeah. civilizational ban so we can keep the hierarchies and the economies and the power yeah. I mean if anybody's paying attention to this this is medicine to make us feel better it's not to get fucked up leave us alone <laughs> yes, yes. Let, let, us, let us let us get better please for, for I mean for such a myriad of reasons too and um, we'll get there we'll actually let's get there because that was the big point about the confidence with the self to be yeah. able to engage um, with coming out and Please come out of the psychedelic closet as soon as possible. Have that confidence with yourself and then talk to your family, friends, coworkers on social media about it. Find your communities that will support your little, uh, your golden nuggets of experiences with consciousness hacking. Um, and But come out as soon as possible because we need you in the world so bad. Yeah. Um, okay, now I want to talk about, I want you to explain the importance of why you started this because you know that there's you had this profound change in your own life from it and then you thought that you could then open the door to um Ouroboros story hour for other people to be able to come and feel that similar profound change in their own experience and share it with other people build a community that's a, these are the big yeah. things yeah 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 but, i mean human beings are storytellers We've always been storytellers. Before we wrote stuff down, people would sit around in the dark, around a campfire, and tell stories. Some of the stories were about the hunt. Some of the stories were about being that time that, that, that something happened when we were out trying to gather food. The time that the, the, that, that, that critter chased you. The, 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 the time we're storytellers, and then we make up fiction as well. And there, I, it, it's a funny thing. I honestly wasn't explicitly conscious about like I gotta like open this thing up to the whole world kind of thing. It just like the, the universe was just pushing me this way, and I knew that the next step in my journey was to now take this to other people, to gather like-minded folks, yes. to help them experience the healing that I experienced. Yeah. It's a, like it's a standard shaman's journey. Yeah. The, you know the, the wounded, you know the the, the the wounded healer. Yeah, yeah. And so here I am. Okay, and and believe me when I tell you, I was far from better. <laughs> when when, when I, I may still be far from better, but it takes a long time. It it it, it, it takes a long time. It's, and our, a lot. it's our whole journey. Yeah. yeah, it's our whole journey. So we we do this, and now in in, in the in the course of getting involved with uh, the with Ben, I now have access to a community of people who. Can I've, I've solved I've solved the uh, you know the, the drug dealer conundrum. <laughs> I now know people and and, yeah. and got introduced to people who did that. This and, is a very important point. I, I didn't actually get to highlight it so much in the, in when you initially mentioned it, but it is so important to increase accessibility to safety, yes. the safe yep. and well uh, conducted psychotherapy sessions. This is so so critical. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. In 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 ceremony, doing it from a ceremonial point of view as well. With intent. Yeah. Yes. So we get through like so all through all the 2016. You know, I'm just kind of like working out the kinks in the project. And I started out where I was highly curating the nights, like picking speakers around subjects. That was my, my, that was my first model. Yeah. And that worked to an extent. And you know, some really some really cool things happened as a result of that. But. The university even pushed me away from that. It's just let things, you know, just let things happen organically. Yes. So we go through like we go through a lot of 20, 20, 2016, all the 2016, 2017. So we're in January of 2018, and I have a I have a nice supply I had a nice supply of mushrooms out of my basement, and I found myself in possession of a day where nobody was around, and I go, yeah, I'm gonna, uh, you know, I think I'm gonna go. Go have a trip. So I get out. I take, you know, I measure out two and a half grams. Um, I get my my eye covers. I put on the Johns Hopkins, uh, you know, soundtrack to you know for for for, uh, for mushroom tripping. I'm laying on the. You know, I, I lay down on my couch, and I'm kind of like falling into this, you know, like nice falling into this nice trip. And I'm actually experiencing bliss for the first time. Wow! But then I hear this noise like. <laughs> so there's there's all these. Uh, they're, they're chainsaws. 
because I live in, I live in, I live in the country. And I'm trying to like not pay attention to that and you know stay you know stay in my head and like hold on to the bliss, and it just that noise just wouldn't go away. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm peeking on the, on the mushrooms. I you know get up off my couch. I look out my window, and I see this army of guys cutting down one of my, one of my neighbor's trees. So that the street I live on, it's really long. Everyone has like two and three hundred feet of frontage. The, we're like not close to one another, yeah. but I, I can see this going on, and they're the way the way that they were cutting down. The, and it was a big tree. The, yeah. When they were cutting it down by lopping the branches first, yeah. and then they were going to cut Correct. the trunk. Yeah, yeah. And something really crazy happened. There was this transference of consciousness with the tree. Wow. And I suddenly found myself experiencing directly the tree's terminal agony. Yes. Wow. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Because it is all so connected. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that also, I haven't really. I, I, this, this is this is a simulation exclusive. I've never told. I've never told people this. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've never told people this part of the, the, I've told the story before, but I've never told this part of the story. It was very traumatic for me to leave graduate school. I mean, it's a big hole for me right now. Like, I feel like I, you know, I'm smart enough to be Dr. Cohen. I was on track to be Dr. Cohen. I'm not Dr. Cohen. So that kind of like limits where I can teach and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's always been this sort of a gaping wound. And there's this, there's, there's this crazy convergence of experiencing the tree's terminal agony, but then also re-experiencing the trauma of leaving graduate school and like this idea of like losing it like rip one one limb at a time and thrown into a, a, a chipper uh -huh. so we get to the end so like now the trees the, the tree spirit is all but all but gone yeah. and i as an act of compassion for the tree spirit i say like, i will take you to ground uh -huh. we together went i took i carried his spirit back to the source yeah Interesting. And so this is this kind of interesting connection, like you know, going back to the, you know, the shaman's journey thing. So in agrarian, in agrarian cultures, uh, when shamans have that, that death rebirth experience, it's done where sp the spirit goes to ground. Hunter-gatherers, they, their, their bodies are flayed and then reconstituted. So I come from farmers, interestingly enough. Um, so we, we, go to, we go to ground together. So another part of shamanic experience is this idea that parts of our soul break off and they go someplace. So that part of my soul rested in the ground mm -hmm. with the tree Interesting. until March of 2017 when an opportunity to participate in an ayahuasca ceremony came along. And I go to this thing and I, it, ayahuasca beat the crap out of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but in, in my second, in, in, in my second, like the first one was like, the, the first one just, it was just all about just being able to survive the night because it was you know, very intensive. In my second journey, I actually had a rebirth experience where I came, like, my spirit came back up out of the ground. It was in the spring. And it was, it was actually Mother's Day of, of, uh, of, of 2017. It was, that, it was that weekend. And that just supercharged the story project. It just, it, it, it was like, bam. I'm re I am reborn. Like praise the Lord, you know. Woo, you know, I'm reborn. Yeah, yeah. The the amount of experiences that you've now curated for other people, both as speakers as well as attendees, is incredible. So you've done you've done 21 of these shares. That's about one a month yep. that you're doing, and this is. Anywhere from 20 to 40 people are showing up to these. You have people speaking on altered states of consciousness, meditation, psychedelics, healing, trauma, helping with their addiction, help talking about ego death, talking about oneness, and the feeling that the speakers, the audience get when they're sharing these experiences. They're, they're able to communicate the golden nuggets. The audience is able to receive. There's a sense of community. There's a sense of awakening for audience members to understanding yeah. how other people have grown and flourished through it. And we make that meaning between us when we talk about these stories. Yeah, we do. It's, it's because I mean, this is, you know, this is you know, crackpot theory 47 for me, but the way, the way I think of communication is that we have stuff in our heads that's filtered through our experiences. 
the people to whom we, with whom we communicate have their own set of experiences. We have some agreement on what words mean more or less. And then when you speak them, that meaning gets and it gets out here, and together we sort of like make something. So in a place like in a place like Story Hour, where we are in the room together and mixing our energies together, there's stuff that there's communication that goes on that's nonverbal. That's not the you know, not the like that's beyond the idea of you know, nonverbal cues like gestures and facial expressions energetically. And so we, the, when we were talking about this before about, about meaning making, it's the thing I kind of like left out of it, it. I left out not a purpose. It's just it's I, I left that part of it out. It's like this idea of being in the space together and our energy connecting. Like we communicate in this deeper way. And so we have this. I, I try really hard when I talk about when I talk about story hour. I always, it, the, the short, it would be easy to call them shows, but they're not, they're shares. Yes. And it's this idea of some, everybody opens their hearts. There are givers and receivers in these things, but the giving and the receiving actually really does go both ways. And that's where we make the meaning, that's where we make the experience when, when, when that happens. And I, I, I can't think of a, well, I'm trying to think now, I can't think of a single time when people didn't come up, storytellers didn't come up to me afterward and say, oh my God, this was just so healing. And then you listen to the side conversations yes. after, you know, after, after the storytelling's done and, you hear, and everybody's engaged in talking about what they heard and you know, understanding that we're, 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 all, we're all miserable. In, in a, not in a way, we all are. And, and, and it's just like this idea that we're not alone. And we're not alone in our suffering. Yes, yes. And it gets back to what we talked about before with the, you know with, with compassion, like the compassion crisis. We don't meet each other in that space anymore. We don't meet each other in, in, in the space of, you know, even if it's not the same thing. I'm miserable. You're miserable. We're human, right? The Buddha says life is suffering. That we we, we all have that in common. You know, the Nazi and and and, and the Quaker. We we're all afraid of the same shit. We're all we all suffer, and it's just how we manifest our fear that 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 that, that you know that, that that shapes what goes on, and that gets back to you know the, the you know the tagline of my of, of story hours. We are the stories that we tell ourselves. Mm-hmm. Nazis tell a particular story about the world. Quakers tell a different story about the world. People who take psychedelics tell a third story about the world, and you know we can argue with the with the, with the, we can kind of like throw the science into it. You know, psychedelics are you know create empathetic states biochemically. Um, we reorgan you know, we we literally reorganize our brains, yes. but we still do not understand the relationship between the chemicals and the reordering of our brains. We, like hence like placebo effect. Mm-hmm. Placebo effect works. Mm-hmm. Well, why does it work? Because what's the source of all the healing? Mm-hmm. You and me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's just how do we, like, what door do we go in through to get to the source to understand that? And that's like, that's like what, it, fundamentally what happens at Orbor Story Hour. That's right. Is we're opening, this, we're, opening, we're opening up the same door and we're all going through the same door. We all have, we are sharing a moment. We're sharing, we're directly sharing an experience. Yes, yes. This ability to open the the communication to source to all that is, have space for that, have space for healing, have space for storytelling, have space for psychedelics, have space for altered states of consciousness, for that love and compassion is just we need more of that. We need more of these stories around the world for people to feel more comfortable talking about them. And you're doing exactly what's needed. You're actually you're actually going even a step further, and then you're taking it on the road. You're doing a documentary here, the ones that you, the shares that you do here, and then you're also you're planning a, one in Providence, one in Portland, Maine, potentially San Francisco. And so this is again, this is one of those things where can we spread the word across the world? Can we get 
more people to do the Ouroboros story hours. I love that. Yeah, it's can we get a bunch of people in the room together to acknowledge that we're human? One of the things I love about the psychedelic community is, how do I put this? When we're out and about in the world, you, you're, you're at your office, you know, you're, you, know you, you bump into someone, how you doing? Yeah, I'm doing all right. When I'm in spaces with people who are, who do psychedelics and we're sort of like, how you, do, how you doing? Like, you get the laundry list of the trauma. Like, people don't bullshit each other. Like, they say, we, here's how, here's how I'm vis- feeling miserable. How are you feeling miserable? Because I care about you too. And it's like just opening, just opening it up to like, not pretending that everything's okay. And not, and not always, uh, that some occasionally it does come up that I am feeling blissful or I am yeah. feeling tons of love and compassion. Yeah. Because sometimes it happens. It hap- <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes we're on the wild up as yep. well. Yeah. Yep. And that we can give ourselves more during yeah. those times and that type of thing. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I, I don't. I, mean, I think every, everyone's journey is different. With I mean, everyone's life journey is different, but everyone's medicine journeys are different as well. And so for me, like it's all been this like baton death march to you know to to fix you know to fix my 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 ancestor trauma to fix my trauma make make a good world for my kids you know put put food on the table all that crap but you actually do have bliss from time to time so last year i went to um, firefly uh, which is a regional burn in vermont Mm -hmm. and i wasn't i wasn't intending to going it's another angel in my story so my 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 friend Paige, kind of just she cajoled me into getting on the waiting list. So like, okay, I'll go on the waiting list. I didn't think I was gonna get a ticket. I got a ticket. So now we're, now we're camping, you know, we're, we're just like really hot, we're, we're camping. And, you know, we're, 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 it's a bunch of us all camping together. So everybody else what goes on, it, it, it burns. <laughs> it's a lot, a lot of drugs. Mm-hmm. And I kind of like wasn't doing many, I, I didn't really want to do a whole lot of drugs. I was like just digging, like being around free, people who just felt free. Mm-hmm. And, the night of the bug burn, uh, someone got the brilliant idea of um, dropping acid and then at the peak of, uh, at the peak of taking acid, um, doing MDMA. So I believe, wow. that's called cam- I believe that's called candy flipping. Candy flipping. <laughs> candy is flipping. The, wow. Yeah. And uh, hopefully there's, again, responsible Oh, use. absolutely. We are, disclaimer, responsible yeah. use. Well, the, the thing is, like, we'd been camping together all week. And you know, we developed, we were like a family and we all stayed together. Yeah. And so the, the, the responsibilities will become evident in a second. Okay. So I, I, I actually did story hour at, at Firefly as well. And we were supposed to do, uh, I was supposed to do one like the, like the night of the bug burn. And I was like, yeah, we're not gonna do that. We are the story. So we get to, um, you know, we, we, you know we, we get to this big open field with the, with the, um, with, 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 with the bug. And we're all kind of like sitting together in a knot, and we're we're tripping. Our hearts are wide open. It gets dark, and for people who have never been in the mountains, where there's no light pollution, the sky is just so different from when we're looking out the looking looking up at the sky at night in, right. in, 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 in Cambridge. And it was this brilliant black vault with di- like the, the the white diamonds just twinkling, and. We were kind of like all we were like all knotted together. It was we, we actually had um, it, it was a consensual platonic cuddle puddle, mm-hmm. and we're all just kind of like pulled in together. And I felt the warmest and safest I've probably ever felt in my entire life wow. from, from that night. Yeah, and I had this I had this vision where I my my mind kind of like traveled back through the eons of time and imagined what humans the way humans coexisted, the way humans existed before we had cities and towns. And, yes, and yes. we were apes that cuddled together for yes, warmth yes. On the, on, you know, in an open field on the mountains because it was dark and we were afraid and together we were warm and we were loving and we were, we were we, we, it, and it was just, I felt just so held and, felt, and it taught, that taught me like in, in effect like what we are, what human beings really are. Yes. That's what we are. All this other stuff, you know, this crap out there, the cars, like all this. Like... Yeah, the, the cars and building and surface level connections yeah. and, and money and economies and all that other type of stuff is a very, very different feeling than the feeling of 
laying there uh, in a cuddle puddle um, where you're looking up at the stars in a non-light polluted area when you're really tapping into that feeling of, of oneness I completely agree I'm glad you brought that story up I want to I want to we, we have a couple other things to hit yeah. on, on the way out um, I want you to you you I mean you gave us a little taste in this and we'll have to talk about it more um, next time but the way that we make meaning between us with words I think such a fascinating topic that we'll um, unpack more um, soon you called it a words are a leaky bucket carrying meaning across the lines I thought that was so funny um, it, it is yeah it is very funny it's very funny and then I want us to hit on um, the you know we've been talking about this throughout the conversation I think it's so important to hit on um, your thoughts on science and spirituality because these two things are so they're so intertwined and they're so beautifully um, able to guide us in a direction of prosperity uh, and so abundance, teaches, yeah. yeah abundance yes yes well so is this, the science and spirituality are entwined in our culture right I mean, it's not explicitly they're not don't, they don't necessarily have to be ex expli explicitly connected but for somebody like me who was born in mid mid century mid 20th century with a mature history of, of science and rational thought I went in the in the direction of science. I became an atheist. I stopped going to church, and it was it was all about materialism, like the like the way, what can I see, smell, taste, touch? What can I measure? And as I, it began this 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 uh, you know the, this journey with, with with psychedelics. I really had to sort of. I had to be able to explain for myself how these things worked, with the science before I could open up to the spiritual part of it. Mm -hmm. And even, even, like even today, I have, to, I have to have both explanations. I have to be able to say, well, I know that, you know, that, that if I take a tryptamine-based psychedelic, that it's gonna, it's gonna interfere with my default mode neural network, that it's gonna, cu it's gonna cut off communication to my pre prefrontal cortex, which is the part of our brain that assigns value and, and, and rational thought, connects to the other parts, opens things up, opens up your heart, you know, fires the H5-HT2A neuroreceptor, um, and, and it's done reliably, and, and, and it's dose-related, and you know, I needed to know all those things to be, to, to feel comfortable enough to put it into my body, to say, okay, I understand how this works, except that <laughs> when I got, when I have gotten into those altered states, all that shit goes out the window. And when I, I we, you and I talked about this in the, in the car when we were driving over, when I first started, it, my, my practice really kicked up with the ayahuasca. So I, I did, last year I did eight or nine ayahuasca ceremonies over 12 months, wow. plus a San Pedro ceremony yeah. with authentic South American folks. Like, not like some dude who knew, who knew how to make ayahuasca tea, yeah. who didn't have their shit together and couldn't hold the space spiritually. Mm -hmm. So in my, first three, in my first three journeys, I have this storytelling project going on. So it's research for my, for my project. You know, it's not, it's not the spiritual thing. And so I very meticulously took note of the, of, of what happened as it happened with the idea that I would plunk these things in on the, on the, uh, the hero's journey model. Around about, my third, around about my third ayahuasca ceremony, I literally lost the ability to, pro to process language. I was, you know, lying, you know, I, was, I was lying on the floor and I could hear people talking. It sounded like Charlie Brown, like wah, 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 wah. I'm completely in my body, like it's all about how my body feels, it's all about, like, I'm having thoughts, but they're not words. It's, it's you know, I don't want to murder Noam Chomsky and, and over, over, oversimplify it, but, but I remember in when grad school talking about this, like, idea of, like, sublang, you know, sub-language level yes, thinking. Yes, And after I, when I had that experience going forward, like, the, re the remaining five, you know, five or six ceremonies after that, I decided to go into the space and to put down my observer mind and completely embrace the journey and not worry about what it meant and not worry about being having to report back to somebody about what what happened yes and then being open to the changes as they occur because like something like we have I mean, anybody's ever done this stuff like you know that there's i mean it's 
it's like it's amazing. It's fucking wild. Like you just the experiences are just like wow, right? And it's the world's best roller coaster ride. And all you have to do is lay on the floor and drink, you know, drink, a, drink, drink a shot of some responsibly in the yeah. right environment, yeah. all yeah. this type of stuff. Yeah. You're so right though with sub language uh, level um, thinking and uh, experience uh, and feeling can just be uh, so critical towards the feelings of of oneness that we need to yeah, to, yeah. That we need to desperately get to um and they're so intertwined we'll get to talk more um science and spirituality as well next time we chat let's do the two questions on the way out of the show the first question is are we in a simulation funny you should say that <laughs> in my very first mushroom trip uh, the, the 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 you know the um the, 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 the psychedelic gods have been very kind to me because they, I, I have like a lot of inner work to do, but I got an opportunity for a very brief moment to pop out of our reality. And I, I got a glimpse of the multiverse. Mm -hmm. And I saw mm -hmm. infinite universes. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, 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 you know, somehow or another, like I needed to know that. And then last month, um, I, w I did a San Pedro ceremony with some folks who are from South America. And actually, I'm going to go practice with them in Ecuador um, in, in, in July. And I was lying, I was, I was, I was lying on, the, on, on, on the ground, feeling the mushrooms. So the word word pops up in, like, in, in, in my field of vision. And I'm looking at this because I was trying to think. I was lying there and I was trying to think of something. So this word "word" comes in. So they start laughing and, and about, about how absurd words are. Mm -hmm. And then I made the universe stop. And then I learned to play with it. And so the idea that I can do that means that this is not exactly real. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's real to us. It's we are the story we tell. Like this, the simulation kind of comes back to this idea of we tell a story about what our what our reality is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we, I something when, when I'm when I'm feeling less than benevolent, I call it a shared delusion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it's real, what it is. So yeah, I think we live in a simulation. Yeah, yeah, the shared simulation. Yeah, yeah, that we all live in. Interesting. Um, and then how about the last question is, what is the most beautiful thing in the world? I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to fall into a, a, a Harry Potter metaphor here. Um, in, in, um, in, the, in, the, in the Philosopher's Stone or Sorcerer's Stone, depending on where, what part of the world you come from, there's a part of the story where um, Harry finds this thing called the Mirror of Erised. And when people look into the mirror, error said, they see what they wish that they were. And Dumbledore tells Harry Potter, "Well, what does a, a content man see in the mirror?" Error said, and it's they see themselves exactly as they are. Yes. And that, to me, like the ability to really be comfortable in our skin, to look at ourselves without the shame and without the self-loathing, and, 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 and just to say, you know. I see myself. Yeah. Yeah. I, to me, I think, because if we all did that, we wouldn't have all the, we wouldn't be doing all this, other, all this, all these awful things to each other because we would be enough for ourselves. Yeah. I believe that's the first time on the show we've had that, that as the answer of looking at ourselves and, and uh, being in the most content with the way that um, we are uh, and confident in where we are at in our life trajectory and in our own shoes. Yeah, yeah just comfortable, in, like being comfortable with ourselves in our own skin. Honestly, that, I mean, it, that, is, my, that's, that is my spiritual work. Yeah, correct. And, and facilitating that for, for hundreds of other yeah. people. And, yeah. and, then, and then sharing this across the world yeah. as well, and then being able to um, get the messages out and get people going in their communities with stuff like this. Yes. Bob, this has been so awesome. I love you so much. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much for having me. journey with us. It's been such an honor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bob Cohen, everyone. Huge thank you for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Also, share more conversations with doing storytelling about hacking consciousness with our families, our friends, our coworkers online. Let's get the stories rolling. Let's get more people talking about this around the world. Make sure to check out the links below to both the facebook.com forward slash Ouroboros story hour, as well as Ouroboros story hour at gmail.com if you want to get in touch. Again, Amelia, thank you so much for letting us use your space, Whole Living Center here in Cambridge. And also everyone, check out the links to simulation below. Help us continue growing and impacting more people and support the artists, entrepreneurs, and organizations around the world that you believe in. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. <laughs> Bob, that was so awesome. I'm glad you liked it. I can't believe that you were almost dead and then you yeah. came back and then you almost killed yourself yeah. and then you profoundly changed yeah. and you got the psilocybin you needed and that you, yeah, and that you did the fat of dosing. This is such a crazy fucking cool, dope, awesome <laughs> journey. I love it so much and now you're doing the hundreds of people. Yeah. It's such a cool journey. I'm so glad that Julia made this happen. And um, It's funny, I wasn't going to do the Harvard thing and then I said, what the hell? <laughs>